Welcome to City Cinema Tech, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. It's our pleasure today to present the great 1941 sparkling comedy by Howard Hawks, His Girl Friday, starring Cary Grant and Rosalind Russell. This is one of the films that defines the American style of comedy known as screwball comedy. It's also one of the films that really summarizes many of the characteristics of the great cinema of Howard Hawks. We'll be talking about that and a number of other things after today's screening. It's a pleasure to have back on City Cinema Tech the distinguished American director, Peter Bogdanovich, who's also known as an actor, writer, and film historian. Now, enjoy the many pleasures of one of the greatest newspaper films ever made, His Girl Friday. Welcome back to City Cinema Tech. So what do you think is going to happen up when they get to Albany and see Mother? Well, we'll talk about that and other things in the next 30 minutes. It's a pleasure to have with us uh, a director himself of screwball comedy, uh, Peter Bogdanovich, also known as an um, actor, uh, author, and uh, film historian. Welcome back to P to City Cinema Tech, Peter. Hello. <laughs> oh, hey, Jerry. I'm fine. We've got Howard Hawks with us today. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's a typical uh, mischievous smile of his, uh, amused at uh, watching Cary Grant and Rosalind Russell. He was a bit younger when they made His Girl Friday, but he had gray hair from a young age, so um, prematurely gray. Well, you know, as a, as a young man, uh, you took it upon yourself to get to know the classic American cinema with, you know, an incredible detail. I mean, as more or less, I, if I can say so, as your film school, the works yes. of, of Hawks, of Wells, of Hitchcock, of Ford, uh, as well as the fact that you, you were able to get to know uh, these incredible masters of American cinema, um, you know, while you were a young man and they were, they were older older masters. How did you get to know Hawks? How did you, and how did you get to know his work, and then how did you get to know Hawks? Well, it's very interesting because when I was 10 years old, uh, two of my favorite films were Red River and uh, I Was a Male War Bride, but I didn't know that the same man had directed them. I no, didn't put that mm -hmm. together for a few more years. But then, when I was about 20, uh, 19 or 20, um, I saw Rio Bravo, another Hawks film. And then I checked to see everything he'd done, because I liked that one. And I, all these films that I loved, like To Have and Have Not. And then I discovered Bringing Up Baby, and then His Girl Friday, and uh, Sergeant York was another film that my parents liked very much. So here was this fellow that had made all these films that I grew up with and, and loved. And so I wanted to know more about him and uh, really wanted to see everything he'd ever made, um, which wasn't easy. Right. Uh, so I had an idea. There was a film of his, a new film of his that Paramount was releasing called Hatari with John Wayne and company, shot in Africa. It was coming out in 62. And um, I called the Museum of Modern Art, and I said, um, Listen, if I can get Paramount to pay for a Howard Hawks retrospective, would you guys put one on? And the curator said, oh, in a second, yes. Howard Hawks, we're, we're very interested in Howard Hawks. We have never done a retrospective. And I called a friend of mine at Paramount, and I said, listen, if I can get the Museum of Modern Art to do a Howard Hawks <laughs> retrospective, would you guys pay for it in, you know, in publicity in connection right. with Hatari? He said, in a flash. Well, that's how I got to see all the Howard Hawks movies. I had to find them and then see them. And then I, Paramount actually paid for me to go to California in early 62, uh, and I met Howard in, in April and interviewed him for three days running. And that was how I met him. Good. And then you, I mean, you knew him for the next... Uh, I knew him until he died, right. uh, which was about uh, 20 years later. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, Hawks and, and comedy. I mean, you know, we've seen His Girl Friday here. We can talk about Ball of Fire or, or hit, uh, Bringing Up Baby, I Was a Male War Bride. Well, he made all the, these great screwball comedies. Yeah. Uh, I think he made 
perhaps uh, the first screwball comedy uh, where the leading characters actually get into a little bit of a little bit of slapstick um, with a picture called 20th Century right. with John Barrymore, which John Barrymore thought was his best performance in movies, and Carol Lombard, who uh, it was her first uh, screwball comedy, and the, the, the name of the genre, screwball, was named after a performance of hers, Carol Lombard's, in a subsequent movie called My Man Godfrey, five right. years, uh, three, four years later, uh, when somebody said it's a real, she plays a real screwball dame. Right. And that's where the words, the, the, it came to name the genre. Before then, those of us in the theater would have referred to it as <laughs> farce. Right. But farce is, you know, farce is, what was it, um, George S. Kaufman said satire, that the definition of satire is what closes on Saturday night. Um, I don't know that farce has ever been considered that popular a word in America, it's a sort of a farce. Right. But screwball comedy is, anyway, what it was, and Hawks, uh, 20th Century was written by Ben Hecht and Charles MacArthur, who also wrote The Front Page, uh, which then became His Girl Friday. Uh, he had an extraordinary knack for uh, speed in his films, mm -hmm. uh, Hawks. Uh, the, the comedies are very fast. His Girl Friday is a good example, uh, about as good an example as you can get. Now, people who at home who don't know how long screenplays usually run, an average screenplay runs about 110, 120 pages. That's an average screenplay. The screenplay, and because what producers usually um, gauge is they, they usually figure about a minute a page. Right. So it's 110 pages, 110 minutes. The script, I don't know if you know this, but the script of His Girl Friday is 180 pages, and the picture plays in 90 minutes. Which means that they would do that each page was they did in thirty seconds, right? And um, you've never seen people talk so fast, <laughs> <laughs> or so much overlapping. But um, you know the genesis of this film. Uh, I know that, that of course there was an earlier screen version of it. There's been two subsequent subsequent ones. Yeah. Uh, and, two, and really? Yeah, no, no, there, there's the Billy Wilder, yeah. um, uh, the front page, taking the original title, right. and then there was a re-adaptation of it, setting oh, it in, right. in in television right. called Switching Channels. Right, right, which wasn't too great. Yeah. But, uh, well, what but, happened on this was uh, Howard Hawks was, had a girl over one night, and this is how he tells it, and I wanted to show her that some of the best modern dialogue ever written was in a play called The Front Page by Hefton MacArthur. So I said to her, you read the part of the reporter named Hildy, even though it's a guy named right, Hildy. Right, absolutely. Uh, and I'll read the, re the editor. And uh, we got about 10 minutes into it, and I said, hell, it's even better with a girl playing the reporter. So I called Ben Hecht, and I said, Ben, we've been reading the front page. I tell you, it's even better with a reporter being a girl. And Hecht said, I bet it is. And <laughs> this is Howard's version. Right, of, right. I'll be right out. And uh, they <laughs> came, he came to California and they started working on it. They didn't, they didn't solve the problem of how to do it until Charlie Letterer, Charles Letterer, right. also a screenwriter and a playwright, wrote Kismet. Uh, he came up with the solution, which was they were married before, right. and they've been divorced. That gave it a context and set up the relationship. Because the play, as you know, Front Page, which is a very, like one of the classic American plays. Absolutely. Um, all plays in the newsroom, uh, the, the place where they all make those phone calls and where the girl jumps out the window, and uh, the main action. So everything prior to that in the screenplay of uh, His Girl Friday is all setting up uh, the relationship and some of the best stuff in the picture, the opening sequence when she comes to the newsroom and they have that incredible scene in his office that goes on forever. Absolutely. absolutely. It plays so fast. And is, is uh, if anybody wants to study it as that, is, is a 
perfect example of something that, if you said, well, it's a scene that goes on for a long while, it just in one little space, people would say, well, I bet it's, very, oh, that's very theatrical. And yet there is nothing theatrical feeling about that scene because the, the seamlessness of the cutting and the discreteness of it turns it into just an incredibly dynamized space as a consequence of the performances and the dialogue and the yes. speed. I asked Hawks once, I said, I noticed you, you didn't uh, get the speed in the picture from rapid cutting. Yeah. Oh, no, it's not done in the cutting. It's done in the pacing within the frame. And uh, you see that in that scene, typically, uh, perfectly, how quickly they play it, overlapping each other and so on. He also told me that he, they wrote the dialogue so that it could be overlapped without losing words. And they do that by putting a handle at the beginning and at the end. Uh, what, what show business, we call it a handle, right. meaning a line like, well, for Pete's sake, what if... And then the rest of it is, right. I go down the street and call somebody. But you, don't, you don't need to hear, well, for Pete's sake, what if. So the end of the previous line, which would be, maybe could be, I'm going out, and that's that. So, and that's that, you don't need to hear either. So the for Pete's sake and the for that's that overlap. Right. And uh, as Hawk said, he, he had noticed that people in life talk over each other. And so he started to, to do that. Well, it's interesting. But to, I had to, But to do it in such a way that you wouldn't lose words. It's interesting because I recently had the chance to, to screen again the Lewis Milestone version of the play, which is 1931, stars Pat O'Brien in the Rosalind Russell um, a role. And Lee and, Tracy. No? A, 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 and uh, no, it's, oh, no, it's, it's Adolf Manju. A, and, uh, Adolf Manju, exactly. And what's very interesting is that Milestone, at that moment in film history, really goes out of his way to break up the action into a lot of discrete shots in, in that way. It really um, is incredibly fluid camera movement and editing for that moment uh, in, in sound film. So uh, what's so interesting about the Hawks is the way in which he, you know, with his ease, with his eye, and particularly with his ear, so that you don't have to do that. You don't have to jump around. Uh, in some in some way, because in the shots in the newsroom, are so frequently composed in a, a longer shot or a medium shot that holds at least three, sometimes six people in the frame, and they're all talking at the same time. Yes, and it plays it's extraordinarily plays plays better than if you're cutting. Because, Absolutely, because within cutting, you you know, it's a kind of manufactured speed, and you can't you can't quite get to the kind of speed. Also, the actors. You see, if you have a, a five, six actors together or three, four actors together playing a scene and you've written it such that they overlap and so on, the actors get into it and you have a certain rhythm uh, that is virtually impossible to get in editing because uh, it's going to always seem manufactured and the performances won't have the kind of rhythm that you want. Well, you, you bring up this very interesting uh, a point that this is a film that while it's visually very sof sophisticated, it's also one of those films that you can, s you can listen to the words for what is said. The, the, the dialogue is extraordinarily clever and very, very American in its, mm -hmm. in, in, its, in its idiom, but at the same time, you can almost simply listen to the rhythms of the speech because they're so, in they're, they're so interesting, the way in which he's orchestrated, but again, particularly in the newsroom. Uh, the newsroom scenes. Very well done. Oh, uh, extraordinary! It's, it's almost as if the voice is part of the sound design, and, and you know, I mean, there's meaning to the dialogue, and, and it carries the story along and develops character. But apart from all of those functions, you can just almost listen to it as music of the uh, of the rhythms of the voices. Well, of course, you know, Orson Welles had been doing a lot of overlapping dialogue on radio. Yes. And, and his radio dramas, he'd, he'd done some of that kind of speed and that kind of thing. And, and Hawks, of course, did it in Bringing Up Baby right. uh, a couple of years before this, and um, Hannah in 20th Century. Uh, it, was, it, it was something that uh, was sort of new in pictures, though. There hadn't been a lot of that. And uh, Hawks, I think, was one of the pioneers of it. Um, well, it's, I, think it's, I think it's good to remember that all of this is happening really less than 15 years after the introduction 
of synchronous dialogue sound. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so like this 12 is twelve years only. Exactly. So, so this whole notion. I mean, this is really innovative. You're talking about people ten years ago, where people are huddled. In, in some of the films are, are huddled around, you know, a plant in the middle of the table because they're speaking to a single thing. And now all of a sudden you have this almost, you know, polyphonic uh, dialogue that's, go that, that's going on that keeps everything lively and, uh, and interesting whenever, uh, even while they're just in a single location. You don't need to go out for a chase. No, it's also um, di somewhat difficult on television to, to, to get it all because it's small and a bit dark. Uh, and you, you have to try to imagine that, you know, it's a big screen. Right. And uh, that you have all that space to uh, settle down into. Um, interestingly, Hawks, uh, as he said to me, uh, you know, the story is a tragedy, which is, of course, the best way to make a comedy. Uh, and yet, he's very serious with the John Quaylen, the, the convict, the fellow who's a, accused of murder. Earl Williams. Earl is the Williams. When, when, when Rosalind Russell goes to see Earl, William, Earl Williams, um, that sequence when she interviews him in the jail is not trying to be funny. In fact, no. it's played very, very straight, very straight, very realistic. And in fact, all the stuff with, uh, with Earl Williams and with the girlfriend, the girlfriend is played very realistic. In fact, there's a is this element that um, you get a sense that Hawks is, uh, and, and the writing, is, is putting down the reporters for being such cynics, for being right. such, such uh, difficult guys. And, uh, and they, you, you may, you're made to feel like, they feel a little bad about it themselves when she leaves. Right. Uh, when she leaps out of the window, I mean, that's a stunning, this is, it stops. I mean, it stops it as a comedy for that. For that moment. For that moment. Yeah. yeah. Well, I asked Hawks about how why he had chosen to do it that way, because you could have done it lighter. Um, but he said we'd learned a big lesson from bringing up baby, which he felt, he thought the mistake he made with bringing up baby was to have everybody crazy. And there wasn't one sane person in the entire movie. And he thought that hurt it to a degree, because there was no, there was no uh, breath of sanity. <laughs> right, right. So he said he never did that again. And so in this picture, which was the next comedy he made, I think three years later, uh, again with Cary Grant, uh, he was very careful to play the serious parts of it and leave them straight, uh, and so that it's not as farcical. Well, you know, and even though, uh, even though it's an extraordinarily beautifully paced comedy and it has the uh, romance at stake of getting the wife who's been lost um, uh, back, and it has saving a man, all, you know, wonderful conventions to drive the plot forward. There's also the fact that, the, the, that there is, uh, you know, a corrupt government here, and that uh, Walter Burns, no, uh, no matter how profound all of his shenanigans are and how much he seems to step over the line, there are those moments in which he says, I'm doing this because we got to get rid of these stinkers. Oh yes, there's that element of, of you know running the rascals out of office, right? And that and he's totally ruthless. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the interesting thing about Grant is he's unapologetically ruthless, uh, and uh, <laughs> steps over the line repeatedly. I mean, he, he could be arrested for any number of things he does in the picture. I've never seen this woman before in my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very funny. Um, he also, there's a lot of sort of inside jokes in the picture. There's several inside jokes in the picture. For example, the character, I don't remember, the Louis, I think, is the gangster, right. isn't he? he? Who gives him the counterfeit money. Absolutely, anymore. Louis. Let me, just looking at it, <laughs> uh, Louis it is dressed and looks like Paul Muni in Scarface. Absolutely. It's a complete, uh, complete right. inside joke. Um, then there's the famous one when Cary Grant says, uh, the last person that said that to me was Archie Leach, just before he cut his throat or something like that, right? Right. Well, Archie Leach was Cary Grant's real name, Archibald Alexander Leach. Right. I said to Hawks, how did that line come up? Well, we had the line. and We said, what name should we say? And I said, Archie Leach, so he said it. <laughs> Whether that's the way it went or not, I don't right. know. The other one, the other one, of course, is a marvelous one. The guy says, you know, what does he look like? Well, he looks like that actor, you know, Ralph Bellamy. Right, exactly. 
which Hawk said they threw it in there and they didn't realize it would get that big a laugh. Well, it's pretty funny. <laughs> no, it's very funny. It's a funny line. It's a very funny line. Since it is Ralph Bellamy. Uh, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so, Hawks, uh, let's just talk about Hawks just for a, a moment. First of all, what do you think he, he contributed? Let's start with the comedy and then sort of the, the larger question. I mean, he's, he, Hawks is not a director. Uh, I, I think, how to put this? I think your description of the way people under, discover Hawks is, is perfectly accurate. That is, your experience is, I think, common to many people. People have watched on television or in a local theater or wh whatever, they all of a sudden have these favorite movies. And then there's a sort of discovery that there actually was a man behind this oh, common yeah. body. Yeah. Well, the difference between, let's say, a, a, a director who's uh, much more famous by name, Alfred Hitchcock. Right. The difference between Hawks and Hitchcock on a simple level is that Hitchcock always made films that were essentially in the crime suspense genre. That was what he did. So uh, the word Hitchcockian came to mean suspense, thriller, that's all. Hawks, on the other hand, did just about every genre you can imagine. He did flying pictures, right. you know, Only Angels Have Wings, Dawn Patrol, Ceiling Zero, because he used to build airplanes and cars, and he did a race, he did a couple of racing pictures too, uh, The Crowd Roars and Red Line 7000. But he did every kind of genre. He did westerns, Red River, Rio Bravo. He did uh, kind of foreign intrigue uh, thriller, uh, did it better than anybody, To Have and Have Not. Right. Did a detective picture, The Big Sleep. Did a musical, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Uh, you know, he, he did just about uh, comedies. Right. He did about every genre. So you really have to get to know Hawks, uh, his personality, to see him from picture to picture. But he's there. Uh, he's certainly there. But it isn't as easy to recognize because the kind of pictures he did w w varied from picture to picture. He even did a horror picture. The science fiction, sort right. of. The Thing. He did the original The Thing. He produced it and I think directed some of it as well. Well, it's interesting because uh, I suspect none, many of our viewers have seen The Thing and it, there's that sort of lurking suspicion. If, you, if you've seen it, say, as a kid and you don't know any of the background, you don't know how to search out who was on the crew or who was a producer, it has a distinctly Hawksian feel to it because there's a bunch of men sitting around in a professional setting, they have to figure out how to kill this monster that's shown up at the Arctic Station, etc. And if you happen to have seen His Girl Friday or Only Angels Have Wings, the way in which the men are bantering and the women interact with the, with, with, with the men just has this signature. And then at the end, when you see, directed by Chris, Christian Nyby, who was Hawks' editor, but you, you don't have to know that. You say, gee, that seemed like a Howard Hawks film. Yeah, produced by Howard Hawks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, he, uh, he, I'm sure he rehearsed that dialogue. I'm right. sure he did. He tried to give Chris Nyby credit because uh, he wanted him to have a career as a director. And Chris Nyby went on and directed uh, about, about a thousand Gunsmokes, I think. Right. But, uh, but how, it's, it's definitely a Howard Hawks picture. You know, he has the, Hawks had the longest unbroken run of hits, I think, of any director in, in picture history. From 1939 to 1951, Right. He, he made 11 movies, and every single one of them was a hit. That's extraordinary. Yeah, that's kind of scary. Yeah. And when I asked him once, you know, his advice about making pictures, he said, Peter, I'll tell you what you do. You make pictures that make money. <laughs> 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 Simple, but in fact, a truth. <laughs> Simple, but not so easy to do. No, yeah, abs absolutely. The interesting thing is that um, those are movies, uh, the majority of which, that we're still watching today. Well, yes, Hawks has a very modern feel. I, I must say, of all the directors, he, his pictures really have a modern feel to them. They don't seem dated in any way. They really don't. Um, his films generally, you could break them down and say that the, the adventure films or the, the quote, serious right. films, all deal with a man, a professional, a professional in a world of danger, in a, in a, in a in dangerous profession, and in 
for example, only angels have wings, they're flyers. It's right. bad weather. Right. Uh, in Red River, they're professional cowboy, you know, uh, cattlemen, and they're on a very difficult trek. Right. Uh, in uh, Dawn Patrol, they're flyers. Uh, again, it's a war situation, uh, and so on. But in the comedies, they're professional men, but usually in a, in a, in a, in a ridiculous situation. Right. Um, um, bringing up baby, you know, he's he's a he's a professor and he's lost his bone. Right. <laughs> you know, where's my bone? <laughs> <laughs> and um, in twentieth century, uh, the professional theater people, but that all, you know, theater people are kind of funny, just going into it, and so on. He's got, a, and then he's got a, an army, army officer in uh, in I Was a Male War Bride, who's French and trying to get into America and has to pretend to be his own wife or something. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but all the pictures, you know, I asked Hawks once about Bringing a Baby. I said, I noticed, how, Howard, that the lighting in Bringing a Baby is rather dark. It's almost like, you know, for a drama. Well, it was a complete tragedy to carry, wasn't it? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Howard had this, I have to tell you, as a guy in a room, he, he had the coolest manner. He was so cool, you know. The, the way I'm yeah. talking is not, not dissimilar to the way he talked. Never raised his voice beyond this much, you know. I saw him like, directing two or three pictures, never saw him raise his voice. Hmm. The, the most, most I ever saw him raise his voice was the one time on El Dorado, I was watching, and the rifle that one of the actors was shooting, Arthur Honeycutt, it kept yeah. misfiring. Right. But, and they ruined about four takes, and he got uh, kind of annoyed, and here's what he said. Oh, that rifle isn't working, let's get it fixed. <laughs> that's 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 that Howard Hawks angry. That was a, a Howard Hawks kind of impatient. <laughs> <laughs> One time, I love this story. Uh, they were shooting Rio Bravo, and they had an down in Tucson, Arizona, and they had a an infestation or a, a calamity involving grasshoppers. Right. They had like a I don't know a migration of ga grasshoppers. There were so many grasshoppers that they had these big, huge lights, you know, and the grasshoppers would go and they would hit the lights, die on instant, and the light would get obscured with grasshoppers within a second because they all died and right. filled up the, so that you, the light, so they couldn't shoot. Right. They were shooting night stuff and all these grasshoppers kept destroying the, the lights. And his assistant told me that Hawks walked over to him, his name was Paul Helmick, and said, Paul, get rid of the grasshoppers. <laughs> and walked away, went back to his home hotel. <laughs> I said, what'd you do, Paul? He says, well, we hired a, a plane and we sprayed the place. Get rid of the grasshoppers. Is well, I don't want to get rid of Bogdanovich, but we've run out, we, we've run out of time. How could we? We just started. Abs absolutely the case. Well, Howard Hawks inspires good conversation, Fast. as well as, indeed, as well as making great films. If you'd like more information about City Cinematheque, please get in contact with us. The best way to do so these days is by going to our website. Go to www.cuny.tv. Or let me say it just another way, www.cuny.tv. Click on City Cinematheque, and you'll find a way to communicate with us. Peter, it's always a pleasure to have you here, bringing your extraordinary knowledge, uh, both as a historian, but also as someone who knew these great masters. I was lucky. Thank you. Thank you for joining, joining us. And thank you for tuning in today. We hope you'll join us again on City Cinematheque when we try to take a stroll through the archives of world film history. Bye-bye for today.